Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, depending upon where you are. Welcome to Association of North America Higher Education International's uh, webinar, Partially Square Structural Equation Modeling, Recent Advances in Model Assessment with Professor Dr. Marco Sarstedt. My name is uh, Professor Jihan Chobanolu. I am the McKibben Endowed Chair Professor at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee. And I also serve as the president of uh, Association of North America Higher Education International. As you all know, we have been bringing you uh, interesting webinars, but this particular webinar has been one of the most popular ones, which we are very, very happy to receive a lot of interest in this particular topic. I would like to introduce, first welcome you to this webinar and introduce uh, Dr. Faizan Ali, he is the assistant professor at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee's College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership. Also, he serves as the director of research methods and statistics for ANI, the organization. I would like to thank Faizan for his very hard work and very, very useful webinars that he is organizing. And I would like to turn the uh, webinar to Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali? Thank you, Dr. Jihan. Thank you. And once again, I would like to thank Marco for um, accepting our request and doing this webinar. Again, we are all a bit overwhelmed with the number of people who uh, registered to attend the webinar. And that's why we were late for a couple of minutes. And for that, we really apologize. Um, okay. So Marco, um, well, again, I don't want to talk too much about Marco, but he, he is the real deal these days. And uh, he is doing quite a lot of stuff in uh, statistics. It, his main area of research is basically marketing, but he is also working in uh, statistics and he is these days one of the top researchers in partially squares based structural equation modeling. Marco has extensively uh, published in top tier journals, including the Journal of Marketing Research, Academy of Marketing Science, uh, Tourism Management, Long Range, Range Planning, Journal of World Business, and Journal of Business Research. Uh, he recently received four or five awards from Emerald, which is, I think, in a record in itself, because normally people get it once or twice in their whole career. So Marco is doing amazing things, um, and he's going to talk about some of those things in his webinar. Uh, with that, um, before we start the webinar, I also want to go through the housekeeping <clears throat> stuff a quick of you who are watching the webinar through Zoom, and I see that there are 106 people on Zoom uh, right now, uh, in addition to the people on Facebook Live. So for people who are on Zoom, um, if you see, there would be an option of raise hand. And if you can just click on that, that would give, an, give us an indication of you listening to us properly, and there's no breakup in the voice or anything. Now, when do you use this raise hand is where you have a question, you can just click on raise hand and uh, ask your question. We'll try to get the answers for your questions. Uh, just a quick thing, if you can just click on raise hand, that would make us uh, feel that you are also listening to us and you understand how to do the raise hand. All right. Um, Okay, um, other than that, uh, we have Anahe, and now we do talk about what Anahe is in the start of every webinar. So basically, it's a nonprofit organization, and the main intention is to promote and encourage a global culture. We do have quite a, f a few uh, member institutions, uh, and most of these institutions uh, work on globalizing student and faculty successes and um, do different type of initiatives in order to deepen global engagement, such as this webinar or some other things. Some of the stuff we do is visit, uh, uh, encourage people to um, take part in research in three minutes program, which is summarizing your research in three minutes. Uh, there's a visiting scholars program Anahe is hosting, and then there are a couple of journals like IIBA Journal and Journal of Global Education and Research. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's a conference, uh, which is Globe Conference, that's coming up June 4 to 8 in Sarasota, Bridenton. I would really request you if you want to have a beautiful, uh, 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 an amazing conference in a beautiful location to consider coming to this conference. Uh, for other details, you can always go to anahe.org and look at all the stuff, amazing stuff Anahe is doing. Um, the next upcoming webinar we'll have is on May 2nd, uh, and it's about how to use guest 
data to increase direct booking. So um, you can mark your calendars for that webinar. Um, all these webinars we have done, the previous ones and the upcoming ones, they are already on the website the ones which already been conducted the recordings are also available on website so if you want to share them with your colleagues or with your students you can always go to the website and get those webinars uh, with that uh, i'm done with the introduction and i would hand over the mic to marco to start his uh, presentation marco yeah okay hold on there we are okay does it work now Yes, we yeah. can see your screen and it's all good. Yeah, super. So hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, welcome from hopefully all over the world to this uh, webinar. Very excited to be here. Also, uh, thanks to Anahi, uh, Faizan, fantastic. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's a great honor and a great, great pleasure to talk a bit about uh, recent advances in model assessment and uh, PLS. Um, well. Faisan already did a nice job in introducing me, um, so I'm not going to be talking about myself too much. Uh, it's probably not of interest anyway, but uh, actually um, PLS is not my only area of research. I also work in uh, data quality measurement uh, topics, especially, which works pretty well, obviously, with uh, PLS. But uh, looking at these Greek symbols and formulas is uh, sometimes a bit depressing. So I also work in consumer behavior, um, specifically in context effect research uh, and sensory marketing topics. Uh, so if you ever want to um, discuss some of these topics with me, I'm happy to do so. But well, today we talk a bit about uh, different things in life, namely um, PLS. And as you might have heard, we publish quite a bit on uh, PLS, not only uh, journal articles, but also a series of books. Um, well, here you see um, our recent, uh, well, basics book, introductory book, um, Introduction to Partially Square Structure Equation Modeling, um, co-authored with Joe Hare, Thomas Halt, and uh, Christian Ringler. And uh, well, we had uh, quite a few colleagues who said very nice words about this book, and it's well received in the market. Um, thanks to you, everyone who's, well, regularly reading it. Thanks for supporting us, uh, it's great. It's also great that this book has been translated into uh, several languages here. There's a Spanish version actually coming up. There's already a, um, two Chinese versions and a Persian version. Uh, this is pretty remarkable for us. And uh, it's just a small indication how well PLS has really developed in the last couple of years. And uh, that is now an established method uh, in the market. Um, we were kind of surprised how well these books were received. And um, we started planning an advanced book pretty soon after the launch of the uh, primer. And this is out now, um, Advanced Issues in Partially Square Structure Equation Modeling that was actually published uh, mid last year. Uh, some of the topics um, we're gonna be talking about today are actually documented in here, but not all of them because uh, recent advances really means recent advances. So I'm going to be talking about things we are actually uh, working on at the moment and that are coming up on the horizon, really. And uh, some of the topics have just recently been, well, resolved, I would say. Yeah. Okay, um, as most of you will know, and Faisan already mentioned it, uh, PLS has really undergone a rapid development in the last couple of years. It's just an overview of the number of PLS uh, studies in the major journals in marketing uh, management and in MIS Quarterly, which is kind of probably the flagship journal of the discipline. And uh, well, you see that uh, the number of PLS studies is really increasing constantly. And uh, this is also my impression when I, when I look at the citations, the number of emails that we get. Um, it's really a, a method that has established itself in the market and um, well, is used by by many disciplines, not only business research, but increasingly in other fields like engineering, um, medicine, actually psychology, um, and so on. So we actually just did a little analysis of some other fields and we were surprised to see um, how strongly it is now disseminating into other fields of science, which is um, obviously a good thing. Yeah? Um, but with all these things, Obviously, also some discussions emerge. Uh, well, it, under which circumstances should we use PLS? Um, is it actually a structured equation modeling method? What are its uh, limitations? 
um, and strengths. And that's actually um, a good discussion, I think. Uh, we, we learned quite a bit during the last years. And um, well, I'm always encouraging all of you also to look critically at um, this method and, and any method. There's no silver bullets out there. N neither method in the world can resolve all issues, but um, we are just learning about, well, the, the mechanisms that underlie PLS, at least to some degree. You know, we already learned quite a bit, but we are still working on it. But anyway, um, just a quick um, recap of some of the concepts we're going to be talking about. I just um, assume that not all of you are like hardcore users of PLS and structure equation modeling. So uh, first to uh, get started really easily, um, just some terminology. Um, what you see here is a, is a path model. And that's actually the path model I'm going to be working with in this uh, webinar. This path model is also the one that we use in our books and also in some of our publications um, as showcase, to showcase PLS and how to run uh, analysis. Um, what you see here, these um, bubbles or ellipses, these are actually latent variables or constructs. So entities um, that cannot be measured um, directly or observed directly, that's what makes them latent, kind of. Yeah. And uh, we have the measured indicators here, uh, the yellow boxes. These relate to, for example, items in a questionnaire. They can also relate to um, variables derived from secondary data, such as, I mean, Facebook data, whatever, some internal or external secondary data, wherever that comes from, such as CRM systems, for example. Um, so what you see here is um, actually a model of corporate reputation. You might be wondering now, well, there's nothing like reputation in here. That's actually true. But we conceptualize reputation in a two-dimensional way, meaning that there's an emotional and a cognitive component. So you can kind of like a company, um, but you can also think it's pretty incompetent. And the other case could also be that you think a company is very competent, but you just don't like it that much. Yeah? So these are the two dimensions of corporate reputation, likability, and competence. The mo this model is also about learning about the antecedents of reputation. These have been identified in prior research works. And you can see here several of these, uh, such as uh, CSR, which stands for Corporate Social Responsibility, Attractiveness of the Company, Quality, Performance. So these are the antecedents of reputation, or of the two reputational dimensions. And we're also looking at the consequences of reputation, more specifically about on customer satisfaction, customer loyalty. Um, two things that you will notice here. First off, um, the, the measures, sometimes you see arrows pointing from the indicators to the constructs. That's what we, like from a measurement perspective, refer to as a formative measurement model. Um, so I'm talking about the measurement perspective here now. And the other direction is here. For example, for likability, you can see that there are three indicators where the arrows point from the construct to the indicators. And this is the so-called reflective measurement model. This is the first thing that I want to point your attention to. The other is the single item construct. Customer satisfaction is measured with a single item. Um, the ones that have maybe read some of my research will know that I'm not a particular fan of single item constructs. I would also advise you not to use them. Um, they are primarily practical, that's true, but um, they also deflate the um, model estimates, meaning that the path coefficients that go out and um, go into such a single item constructs are likely going to be too low, uh, meaning that um, the corresponding paths are not going to be significant. And um, this is not because there is no effect, but it's simply because uh, your, measuring, uh, your measurement model is not of sufficient quality, yeah? So uh, there are instances where this works pretty well, but in this case, we included it only as a showcase so that um, users understand how to validate a single item construct. So that's the model we're gonna be working with. And um, here's some terminology, just in case you need to flip back um, during the webinar. We're gonna be talking about some of these things here, such as reflective and formative models. Um, well, depending on, which model we are looking at, we primarily look at the loadings, which are simply bivariate correlations between the construct and the indicator. 
and the weights are partial correlations. Yeah, also correlations, but they mean, uh, well, how much is a certain indicator correlated with the construct, given that there are also other indicators that also have a significant bearing on that construct. Um, we see um, the structure model here. The structure model defines the relationships between the constructs. Um, they are indicated as errors here. So these are actually predictive relationships and we have uh, the estimates for these errors are the past descriptions. Yeah? Um, and each of the, these latent variables or constructs has an own measurement model, yeah? such as here, Y1, this is the measurement model for um, the latent variable Y1. And Y1 is exogenous here because uh, it predicts Y3. And Y3 is endogenous because it is being predicted by Y1 and Y2. So just some recap on the, the basic terminology here. Um, so we are actually, today we are dealing with a very specific part of uh, PLS modeling. Um, we established such a six or, well, or seven step process, depends on how you see it. Uh, we typically start with the um, specification of the structure model. Um, followed by the measurement models, we collect the data, get rid of outliers, straight lining, all these things that are common in statistical analysis. We estimate the path model, and then we engage in the measurement model assessment. This is fundamental because if the measures are not of um, sufficient reliability and validity, it makes no sense to look at the structure model, that is the results or the estimates between the constructs. It's obviously if you have garbage in, meaning that the measures are not of high quality, then there's garbage out. Whatever comes out of these measures um, is not really meaningful either. Yeah, that's why we first need to look into the measurement model qualities. The measurement models, um, we're not going to be dealing with this today. Um, that's, there's ample uh, literature on measurement model assessments. I just want to point your attention to some recent advances here in um, in reflective measurement model uh, evaluation, uh, the HTMT, heterotrait, monotrait, ratio of correlations, that's a new measure, relatively new measure for assessing the discriminant validity of reflectively specified constructs. Uh, we have an article to, together, like Christian, your counselor, and myself in uh, JAMS, uh, published in 2015, and we have a, a recent follow up article. Um, George Frankie and myself in internet research, in case you're interested, I'm happy to send that to you. It's also available uh, on ResearchGate. And uh, with, um, with uh, Faison, actually, we have a recent study on formative measurement model assessment and redundancy analysis here. Um, please check our, our reference list and happy to send that to you. But anyway, today we're going to be talking about the structural model assessment. and. Structure model assessment basically deals with um, four steps. Um, first, we need to check collinearity within the structure model. And um, this is usually taken care of by discriminant validity assessment. So if your constructs are discriminant valid, they typically also um, do not have significant levels of collinearity. Um, the second thing we look at is actually the significance and the relevance of the structure model relationships, um, or the, yeah, the, uh, the path coefficients. And uh, this is done by bootstrapping. So um, I'm not going to be talking about step one and step two now because these are pretty well established. Um, it's getting actually more interesting here with steps three and step four. And um, let's focus on these now. So <clears throat> looking at step three, the predictive performance of a model. Well, there are actually two types of um, predictive performance we can look into. There's the in-sample prediction and there's the out-of-sample prediction. Um, in our early works, we didn't really differentiate between these two and this contributed to some confusion. Um, and uh, now in our, our latest works on PLS and tutorial articles, we clearly distinguish these two concepts. So in sample prediction means that you actually use the entire data set to estimate the model. And then you use these estimates to predict observations from the same data set. Yeah, it's kind of, um, well, using all the information that you have, and then you try to reproduce this information. It's commonly, this 
is what the um, coefficient of determination does, the R square, and um, it's actually considered either as a measure of explanatory power or in sample prediction. Yeah, it's very much the same. Yeah, so we're going to be talking really briefly about this one. There's also the effect side F square, which we're not going to be talking about today. The problem with the R square is that it's only related to the in sample, so to the data that's already lying around. It says nothing about a model's um, ability to predict new observations. But the thing is, this is actually what prediction is all about. Yeah? You want to know how a certain um, or, or what a certain observation looks like for which you don't have the entire information. Yeah, so you want to predict new observations, kind of the analogy of a bank where you want to set up some credit rating system and you want to assign credit scores to your customers. And you do this using your entire database and then a new customer comes into your bank and you want to have well, a reasonable good prediction of what the credit score for this new customer is going to be based on, for example, social demographic information. And that's the same logic here. We actually, in an out of sample prediction case, we want to predict new observations or observations that have been gathered in a different context. The blindfolding base, Q square, is kind of a measure of out of sample prediction, but for reasons that I'm going to be talking about, it's actually not truly an out of sample prediction method. Much better here is so called PLS predict, which was introduced um, one and a half years ago by Gali Chmueli and some colleagues in Journal of Business Research. And I'm going to be talking about this procedure and guide you through um, well, how to use it, actually. So <clears throat> I'm sure all of you will be um, familiar with the R-square. Coefficient of determination tells us how much variance of a certain endogenous construct is, is being explained by its direct antecedents. Varies between 0 and 1, and there are also rules of thumb that we define in um, our book. Um, well, actually, now the webinar is given by the only author who opposed having these rules of thumb in the book, because I just don't think that they are very um, accurate. Reason is that it depends, obviously, on the model and on the context. Let me give you an example. If you're in a consumer behavior context and you run a, a certain experiment in the lab, and in this experiment, you control like all the extraneous factors, so all influencing factors are controlled for, you want to be able, really be able at the end to explain a certain behavior. So the R square, you expect it to be pretty high, uh, like 80%, maybe 70%, something like this. However, if you run a study and you want to explain um, um, abnormal stock returns, so you want to know why people purchase stocks or you want to explain why stocks move in a certain way they do, to be more precise, where having an R square of 80% would be marvelous. In fact, if I came up with a model like that, the last thing is that I would do is publishing this because I would have found like the, the formula for um, predicting stock returns. And um, then I would just keep that to myself and already think about which deserted island I'll uh, emigrate to. Yeah, so. It depends on the context. Um, we have these rules of thumb in the book, but um, I would be a bit cautious. I would advise you to just look into prior research, compare your model with that of prior researchers, also in terms of model complexity. Because the R square obviously in, typically increases with more predictors, yeah, practically always. Yeah. So uh, that's what I would advise you to do. There's also the adjusted R square which um, we use for model comparisons. However, latest research I'm going to be talking about uh, at the end of the seminar um, tells us that the adjusted R-square is actually not a very good indication for comparing models. So um, I'm just going to skip this part. Yeah. <clears throat> a bit more interesting is the blindfolding or blindfolding based Q-square. And um, blindfolding is actually a procedure in which we systematically omit certain data points. Then we replace these data points with a naive prediction, which is a mean. And then we use the estimates to predict these data points. This kind of sounds like out of sample prediction, right? But actually it isn't um, because we don't um, eliminate entire observations, but only specific data points. 
let me show you an example for this. Yeah, I think it gets a bit clearer when you actually see a model and see how that works. So what you see here is a simple model. We've got two exogenous constructs, Y1 and Y2, and an endogenous construct, uh, Y3. So the measurement models here are not relevant for us now. The endogenous needs to be measured with reflective indicators, which is obviously the case here. And uh, we have a small um, example data set down here, just seven observations. Yeah, and these are standardized uh, indicator scores. So these are not the original scores, but they are the ones after standardization. And as you can see here, we have got these seven observations for X1, uh, X31, X32, and X33. So what we are doing now, we are defining an emission distance. And this emission distance tells us which of these data points are going to be emitted in each of the blindfolding runs. So for example, if we specify an emission distance of three, that means that every third data point is emitted in each blindfolding run. And this is actually indicated here. For example, in the first run, all the um, data points where this little label D1, the blue one, is um, put, these are actually emitted. Yeah? So the first observation of X31, the fourth observation of X31, and so on. So we are moving here by column and from left to right. In the second run, all data points with D2 are going to be omitted. And in the third run, all the ones where we have the D3 label are going to be omitted. So that's actually, um, this is actually illustrating it. And um, in the first blindfolding run, well, we still have um, data for all the observations in place. Um, the boxes that are now shaded here for these, we have the mean value replacements. And uh, the model is estimated for blindfolding run one, one, two, and three. And in each of these runs, we try to predict the omitted data points. Um, and I'm always talking about data points, not observations here, yeah? because again, we're not deleting entire observations. Um, depending on which of these uh, methods you, you choose, there are different ways of actually predicting the, um, the dependent uh, constructs indicator points. There's the cross-validated redundancy and the cross-validated commonality. They just take different routes for prediction. Um, usually they don't diverge very much. And um, well, there's a slight tendency to use this cross-validated redundancy because, well, we have always done it that way. But there's not strong reason to prefer one over the other. Um, Win Chin once said, um, the cross-validated redundancy fits PLS like hand and glove. And so that's kind of why it's probably established. I don't know. Yeah? So we also recommend using it. But as I said, there's not much difference anyway. Um, generally, we say, well, Q squared should be larger than zero. Then there is some type of um, predictive relevance. Um, and uh, we can also um, relate to these um, to these rules of thumb here, what constitutes strong Q-square and not so strong Q-square. Um, but generally, Q-square should be larger than zero, and there's some type of prediction action going on um, or predictive accuracy in the model. The only thing you need to consider is that uh, the emission distance D must um, not chosen such that if you divide the number of observations by D that you actually get an integer value that has got something to do with the replacement or, or the, to the emission of the data points. Yeah? For example, if you have 100 observations, D must not be 2, 5, or 10. Yeah, you could choose D as 7, for example. Um, so we, um, at some publication, I think we erroneously, and I think that's really erroneously, we refer to Q-square as a measure of out-of-sample prediction. And actually, strictly speaking, it's not. It's, it's kind of like an out-of-sample prediction method but not really, because you're not uh, omitting entire observations. This has been critically noted by uh, Galich Muili and her co-authors in the JBR paper. And um, we looked into the machine learning literature, and that's actually truly correct. Yeah? And machine learning is kind of the blueprint literature for prediction, or, in our opinion. So that's why we um, corrected our uh, statements in that regard. And we're a bit cautious here. Um, in labeling it in sample or out of sample prediction met, uh, metric. Yeah. So, um, where it gets more interesting now, and that's probably in the, the stuff that most of you will be interested in, is actually um, PLS predict. 
because PLS predict is truly a method for out of sample prediction. In PLS predict, what we do, we actually omit certain part of the observations. We estimate the model and then we try to um, predict the omitted part. So what PLS PLM predict does is it uses a training data set. So training data is the data that is actually being used for model estimation and the testing data or holdout data, which is actually not used to estimate the model. That's the one that we actually want to predict at the end. When we talk about prediction, we have to talk about um, errors. Yeah? What's the error in the prediction? Yeah? So for example, you would have an original value of five and you're predicting a six where there's an error, right? So your prediction is too high at yeah? six and the original value is five. So there's different, there are different ways how to express such a prediction error. Well, a very naive way of doing that is just to take the error as the predicted value minus the test value. So this is a very naive way of putting it. But the problem obviously is that positive and negative deviations could cancel each other out. So let's say once you have a prediction error of one and then of minus one, on average, you would be fine, which is obviously not very sensible. That's why um, there are different metrics here. And uh, probably the most popular one is the root mean squared error of predictions. Um, so as you can see here, it takes the, um, the prediction error and minus the average prediction error and squares these differences. And um, this means that smaller deviations, like smaller prediction errors are not considered very severe versus very large prediction errors are um, actually considered as very severe. So they actually are weighted stronger because of the squaring. Um, so the RMSE is typically used um, in prediction studies, uh, probably because it it weighs greater prediction errors more strongly than smaller errors. However, <clears throat> there's also the mean absolute error, which also features strongly um, uh, or prominently in research. Um, so this is just the, the absolute value of the uh, error and then divided by the number of observations. And we have the MAP, the mean absolute percentage error, um, which in the, I think the 90s was kind of preferred, I think but it has several characteristics which make it not really well very attractive particularly not for pls because as you can see here it is it is not defined for um for variables where there's a zero value as you can have in the uh, denominator here the x test and so if this is zero you're well um you're dividing by zero which is obviously not working yeah so this is particularly problematic in pls if you use um, the MAP for latent variable scores, which usually oscillate around zero, and it could be that because of rounding, you actually have a zero value here, and then, well, the uh, entire uh, analysis collapses. Another issue is that equal errors above the observed value result in a greater absolute percentage error than those below. So actually, various uh, errors above are weighted more strongly than errors below in MAP. That's why we don't advocate using MAPE, but focusing on the MAE or the RMSE. Use the RMSE if you believe that stronger deviations, like strong or higher prediction errors, are more severe. Use MAE if you think, well, there's not much difference. If it's a small or big error, it doesn't matter. All of them are weighted equally. Finally, <clears throat> we have the Q square. And this is actually analogous to what we've just seen in blindfolding based Q square. I'm going to be talking about that when we uh, see some examples. Uh, we actually use this as a, a kind of a naive benchmark. Um, what does that mean? Um, we actually just use the training data's mean um, as a prediction for the, uh, for the emitted variables. So we just use the training data, take the mean value, and this is kind of our best guess. This is the most naive benchmark that you can think of. Yeah, so if a model performs badly in terms of Q square, you really have a problem. Uh, that's how we can put it. So <clears throat> how does PLS predict really work? Um, I told you that um, we split the data set into a um, training and a holdout set. And um, what, how does that work? We first need to specify K. K is the number of folds. This tells us into how many parts the data set is being split. So we, um, 
estimate the model k times, I mean, if you set the folds to five, you're estimating the model five times, but not with five, um, five parts of the data set, but only with four. One is being omitted in each of the runs. We predict the observations using the estimated model parameters and calculate the prediction statistics based on the holdout set. The thing here is that, well, as this is a random process, the, um, the partitioning into k equal parts it could be that in one of these, um, these samples, you actually have a very extreme sampling. Yeah? So um, it could be that some of the observations or one extreme, some of the extreme observations are put into one of those folds. That's why we repeat this procedure um, r times. r is the number of repetitions. Um, well, which values to choose for k and r? Well, <laughs> the difficult to tell. In prediction literature, people usually use uh, 10 folds and 10 repetitions. You know, so to get a, some stability of the estimates. So this is just illustrating how that works. Um, for example, here in the first fold, we have our training data set. So we have these four buckets of data. These are actually used for running the model. And whatever we get out of here, the estimates are used to predict the test fold, the first one here. And uh, we are um, estimating the prediction statistics over here to the right-hand side. Next, we use the second um, set of data. Um, we take this out and use this as a holdout data set and use the remaining data sets, the remaining folds to predict the holdout set. And this just repeats until we have uh, taken out all the holdout data sets and all the folds possible, yeah, these, all these test values here. And we repeat this thing 10 times. So we get different petitions in the test and training data set. So the problem with this is, generally, um, we don't have any standard of comparison. They're like RMSE and the MAE values, well, they don't tell us very much as such because they depend on the scaling of the variables. So we need some type of standard of comparison. And um, there are actually two different standards of comparisons or benchmarks that we propose. One is the naive benchmark, the super naive benchmark, let's put it like that, the mean value Q squared. This just uses the mean value of the training sample. And yeah, this is the naive benchmark. We want to predict better than that. Another thing that we can do is specifying a linear model. And this linear model um, takes the exogenous constructs indicators and uses these as independent variables in the regression. And the dependent variables in the regression are the indicators that we want to predict. So I'm just flipping back real quick and show what that looks like in our, in our data set here or in our model here. So for example, if we want to predict these three indicators for customer loyalty, decide again, remain customer and recommendation, we would run a regression of these three indicators on these indicators here of CSR attractiveness, quality and performance. So all these indicators here um, of these four exogenous constructs would be used as independent variables. So why is this useful? Well, it gives the algorithm some indication what is exogenous and what is endogenous here. But the entire model structure is omitted. So we don't have any information or we don't process information regarding the PLS path model structure. So we don't know that there's likability and competence in between and what these relationships look like here. That's all omitted. That's what makes this a naive benchmark. And we compare now the well, RMSE and MAE values of the PLS model with naive benchmarks. And we would expect that we get lower prediction errors, like lower RMSE and MAE values for the PLS model compared to the naive benchmark. Because at the end, you want your model, which has this nice structure uh, that you came up with in your theory, to predict better than the most naive thing that you can think of. So if we still have time, I can show you um, um, the results for uh, doing this actually in the smart PLS software. But in light of the time, I just want to move on and talk a tiny bit about um, a goodness of fit, because I know that this is uh, a topic that several of you are probably struggling with. So um, there's actually a need for goodness of fit measures in structured equation modeling. 
know, because you want to be able to tell whether you have a good model or a bad model, right? I mean, this is kind of what structured equation modeling at least partly is all about. And there's a strong tradition, obviously, in covariance-based structured equation modeling to look into uh, fit measures. Right? So it's actually um, like an auto an automatic kind of, you first look into the, uh, the um, goodness of fit measures and um, if the model does not fit well, well, you kind of modify it, which is, well, you're actually leaving the confirmatory route and going into exploration, yeah, which is actually not what you're supposed to do, but that's kind of research reality. Yeah? Strictly speaking, if the model does not fit well, you would have to, well, reject it and start all over again, which actually no one really does. So we are kind of exploring different model alternatives. And um, all these different fit measures in the covariance-based context are based on the same logic, namely that you have a um, correlation matrix which you can observe the empirical correlation matrix, and the one that is model implied. Model implied means that it is kind of a reproduced correlation um, given that the certain model that you have, so and the model estimates that you have. So here you're reproducing the correlation um, based on the model estimates. And uh, well, if the model fits very well, or it fits the data very well, you would expect that there's a small divergence between what you actually observe and what you reproduce based on your data and the model that you specify. Yeah, so this difference should be minimized. And this is what all, practically all measures of model fit in covariance based SEM are all about. Yeah, they somehow quantify this divergence between the empirical correlation matrix and the model implied correlation matrix. And they are basically based on the chi squared test, which tries to quantify this difference, right? And um, there's also something like goodness of fit, obviously, in PLS. Uh, it started actually um, early, um, actually earlier than 2005, where uh, Tenhouse and colleagues um, proposed the goodness of fit index. And um, it's actually a nice index, but it's kind of mislabeled because they said, well, it's an operational solution to the problem of the fit measure in PLS. And actually, it is not because it, it follows the PLS tradition in terms of well, prediction but it's not goodness of fit as we would all ever define it in a covariance-based SEM sense. So you see, um, in the original publication, it looks really fancy, but it's in the, in the actual computation, it's really easy. It's just the average commonality times the average R square and the square root of this. And the logic behind this is that you want to explain as much variance as possible in the model, the R square, and also in the measurement models, that's the commonality. The problem with the goodness of fit index is it makes very little sense to use it for single item constructs because the commonality or the average variance extracted, same thing, yeah, is by definition one. So it makes little sense. It's not defined for formatively measured constructs and doesn't really consider model complexity because you can simply boost the R square by just adding more errors pointing at a certain construct. So you can, if you make the com model more complex, you increase the R square by definition, yeah, unless the exogenous constructs are all perfectly uncorrelated with each other and with the dependent variable, which is actually never happening. You know? um, we also took a look at um, its performance in our um, study here in, in computational statistics. And um, I'm not going to be talking about that. I just put it in, in case you're interested in, in learning more about this um, and how it actually performs. But the bottom line of the study is that the goodness of fit index is actually not capable of separating um, like good models or the true model from wrong models. Yeah, and it's actually not even indicating acceptable models like parsimonious models um, compared to other grossly misspecified models. Yeah? So um, that's why we don't really advocate it, but it has its uses in, in other contexts, but it's not a goodness of fit index. Yeah? Um, but there are actually goodness of fit indices out there for PLS, and they actually have been proposed in the, in, in the 80s, uh, Lohmöller, was a, a doctoral researcher together with Herman Wold who initiated PLS. He um, came up with several measures and he borrowed them from the um, covariance based SEM world. So there are basically three types of goodness of fit measures. Um, the first one follows the exact same logic as um, the ones that I just talked about in CB SEM sense in the covariance based SEM sense. They try to quantify the divergence between the correlation matrix that you actually observe and the one that is implied by the model. 
So one is the SRMR, and this is nothing but the standardized difference between the observed and kind of the predicted or model implied correlations. And this measure is scaled such that you would actually like to have values close to zero. The threshold value that you frequently read is like 0 0.08 or 0 0.1, depending on which paper you're looking at. There are also um, other ways to quantify these differences via distance measures. We're going to be talking about these, the ULS and DG. They're just two different ways how to quantify these distances. The second type is the RMS theta, the root mean squared residual covariance. And the root here to um, indicating model specification issues is a bit different. What you do here is you look into the residuals of the measurement models, yeah? of the reflective measures. You're looking at the residuals. And these residuals should not be highly correlated because if they do, it suggests that there's some, some common error that yields or triggers these correlations between what you cannot explain in the model between the residuals. So there must be, for example, something missing or there is uh, some model specifications is wrong. Yeah? So these outer model residuals or this measurement model residuals um, should not correlate highly Hence, the RMS theta should be really low, which means like between 0.12 and 1.4 and lower than that. Finally, there is the NFI, which has also been um, suggested in the PLS context. But, um, well, just to give you an idea, it compares the chi-square value of the model that you're looking at with that of a null model. Null model means it's a naive model with actually no information, you know, just the constructs, no linkages. And um, this has actually been debunked in a CBSEM context. It's been very ineffective. And um, well, I'm kind of struggling with this measure also. So I'm not really be, going to be talking about this today, but like more about these type one and type two ones. They, they, if you want to use them, then rather rely on the SRMR, exact model fit test, or RMS theta. So one <clears throat> problem here is um, we have the observed correlations. OK, these are clear. That's the one, the, these are the ones that we can actually get from our indicated data. But what are the model implied correlations? Where do they actually come from? And um, well, there are two ways of doing or looking at that. And, the thing is, um, this is not really resolved. So where do the model implied correlations come from? Yeah? So if you look at the recent PLS literature, there are like new guidelines for using PLS and they strongly advocate using goodness of fit measures. Um, this is fine. Yeah? But the thing is, they remain silent on how these measures are actually computed. So how the model implied correlations are actually where they are coming from and even software um, that actually gives you indication of um, the SRMR, for example, gives no technical documentation on where these model implied correlations actually come from. Yeah? And this is far from trivial because there are like, different ways of um, computing them. And here are just two ways that are actually implemented in smart PLS. One is the so-called separated model. And here, the model implied correlations are derived from the construct correlations. So for example, you would have the correlation between one Y and Y3, you would use this. And based on these correlations, you can derive the model implied indicator correlations. The other way of doing it, for example, looking at the actual model estimates. And here we would use the correlations between the constructs if they are actually not linked in the model, like Y1 and Y2, we would use this correlation between these two constructs. And another way, um, if they are actually being linked, we use the path coefficients. So for example, y1 and y3, you can see an error pointing from y1 to y3. Here, we would not use the bivariate correlation, but the path coefficient, which, well, gives you um, also the correlation, but considering the fact that there's also y2 predicting it. Yeah? So the partial correlation here. What about the linkage between Y1 and Y4? Well, here we will take the total effect. You can see that you can go from Y1 to Y3 and from Y3 to Y4. And if you multiply these pass coefficients here, you get the total effect. And this is then being used as input to derive later on actually the model implied correlations between the indicators. 
So these are just two ways of getting the model implied correlations. And well, for the SRMR, you would expect the SRMR to have an absolute value less than 0 0.08 um, or 0 0.10, depending on which literature you look at. You can also look at it from a inference statistic point of view. You can compute the confidence interval and check whether the original value of SRMR falls into, let's say, the 99% confidence interval. Um, what does that mean? If it falls into the confidence interval, well, you can be sure that the estimate is actually reasonably stable. If it falls outside, well, it's instable. Then you would tend to reject the model. So this sounds pretty logic, but there are some issues here. So first off, we don't really know about the threshold. So there's no full-blown um, study out there uh, simulation study, which actually looks into the performance of the SRMR. So we don't know how it's actually performing. Well, we have got some idea, yeah? We actually did it in organizational research methods article, but we don't really truly know uh, how it performs, performs different model constellations. Thus, the rule of thumb is tentative. Yeah, we kind of derived this and from the CBSEM literature and also from, um, uh, from our simulation study, but that was really small scale, so we don't really know. Plus, it's unclear what the model implied correlation matrix should look like. Is it the saturated or the estimated model or some other way? So we don't really know that either. Um, a similar situation emerges here for the, um, for the distance measures. So this is like in a, in a cluster analysis where you have data and you compute distances. You can compute the distance between two data points. Same thing here. We want to compute the distance between the empirical correlation matrix and the model implied correlation matrix. And there's like a almost infinite number of distance measures that you can use. <coughs> um, your Kanzler and Theo Dijkstra, they propose a geodesic distance and unweighted least squares uh, distances. Um, well, because prior research has used related measures, um, but they could have also used other measures. Yeah? So the, the issue with VOLS and DG is that the absolute values don't tell you anything because they depend on the scaling of the data. So we have to look into the inference statistics. And same thing here, we check whether the original value falls into the 99% um, confidence interval. If it does, it's fine. If not, we would have to reject the model. So same thing here. We don't have really large scale simulation evidence of these criteria's performances. Um, we don't have clear guidance whether to use geodesic or um, the unweighted least squares discrepancy. And uh, same thing as before, what does a model implied correlation matrix look like? Finally, <clears throat> the RMS Tito, I'm pretty much in favor of, of this uh, metric because it, it's kind of nice, like from a theoretical point of view, it's kind of convincing, I think, if there are strong residual correlations, there's something wrong in the model, it's a misspecification. So this kind of makes sense, um, but it's only, really defined for reflectively specified models. Actually, the smart PLS also gives you the RMS theta for formatively specified models, but this is based on the loadings that you can also compute in the formative specification. So um, this is really not, um, this is not really reasonable. Yeah? So it actually it's only um, reasonable to be interpreted for reflective models. But same thing here, rule of thumb stentative, it hasn't really been evaluated full scale. So, um, I'm, I'm skipping the NFI, um, I wouldn't advocate it, but um, from my prior descriptions, you can already see that I'm a bit skeptical regarding the use of these goodness of fit measures. It's not that I don't appreciate the value of using goodness of fit measures, it's just we know very little about their performance to date. Yeah, and I'm sure that there are researchers out there, maybe you're listening now, uh, to me and who are running simulation studies to see how they actually perform. Um, and that's what we actually need. Yeah? So there's strong need for simulation studies like this. But there's a second reason why I'm a bit skeptical about the, um, the need for goodness of fit. Um, and there's probably a need, but I wouldn't overemphasize it. Yeah? Um, reason is that PLS has actually been designed as a causal predictive method. So what you want to have is a model which fits the data well and not like perfectly, but well, uh, but also does a good, a reasonable good job in predicting the dependent variables. 
if we now advocate, strongly advocate the use of goodness of fit indices, we go, go the same route as CBSEM, where fit is everything. Yeah, so we start tweaking around with the models until they fit, yeah, until like squeeze the data and the model until they confess. And I'm not a big fan of that because I think it puts um, a hold on our creativity in, uh, in research. But I also see the upside of using goodness of fit, obviously, because you don't want to have a grossly misspecified model. So I truly think that we need some kind of balance between having a good model that is correct in a, well, chi square sense, yeah? but it also should predict well. And these are two extremes, explanation and prediction, which we have to somehow uh, merge to a certain degree. And that's not easy. Yeah? There's a parental affection in social sciences for explanation. So we just love to look into model fits. We love to look into these things, but it's a kind of ironic because at the end of the day, what we want to do is give managerial implications. So we want to give recommendations to researchers. And you look at those papers and they always talk about model fit. And you look into all these fancy statistics in CBSEM and then you have a well-fitting model. But at the same time, well, CBSEM is grossly unsuited for prediction. That's the first issue. And then at the same time, well, a model that fits well is not necessarily a good predictive model. It's actually quite the opposite usually. Yeah? So a model can be uh, very well in terms of fit, but it predicts very badly. And similarly, a grossly misspecified model can be perfect in prediction. Yeah? If you look at this text down here, and I just copy pasted it into here and highlighted some things. You might have read it by now. Um, this is actually um, a recent article by Hoffman and colleagues on um, prediction in social systems and science. And they criticize our parental affection for explanation. And uh, it's actually true. Yeah, I fully concur with this. So that's why I'm a bit skeptical about, um, about goodness of fit, the concept of goodness of fit in PLS, but I still see the value. So I don't want to debunk it as being useless or so, not at all. Yeah. But we should be cautious in balancing explanation and prediction. And that's actually what we try to uh, communicate in our latest research article. Finally, to wrap it up, um, we, are, we have been working during the last couple of years on, um, on model selection issues. And this also relates to structure model assessment somehow. So in, there are situations where you have um, different models stemming from competing theories. Yeah? So you might have theory A, which, um, which suggests a certain model structure versus uh, theory B, which suggests a different model structure. So which one are you going to use? Yeah? Model A or model B? And um, up to date, um, or up to certain weeks ago, really, <laughs> uh, people would be looking to the adjusted R-square. Yeah? So the adjusted R-square gives us an indication of the explanatory power of a model considering also the uh, model complexity. So it penalizes a complex model. The thing with this is it doesn't really work well. And we actually showed this in a recent paper. And in this paper, we also give recommendations of criteria which you can use for model comparisons. Um, these will look familiar to you because they are actually um, part of every statistical package that runs regressions or also factor analysis. These are called information criteria, and they have been developed in the information theory context. They are typically formulated in terms of the log likelihood. And as you might wonder now, well, PLS is a non-parametric method, so where does the likelihood come from? Well, there's no need to really, because they can also be written in terms of the sum of squares error. And that's actually when you run Stata, for example, or most R packages, that's how these um, criteria are actually computed by these packages. So they don't run log, uh, like likelihood or maximum likelihood in the background. They actually use the simple um, OLS on their least squares and use the sum of squared errors to um, compute these criteria. The only issue is we need to have normally distributed residuals, which is, however, practically always the case. Yeah. So even and if even if they're not normally distributed, these criteria are pretty stable. So in our um, forthcoming uh, Journal of the Association for Information Systems paper, we actually look into the performance of these measures uh, for model selection, meaning can these measures identify wrong models 
or and can they identify the true models or at least parsimonious versions of it and the BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion, and the GM, they are particularly well suited for these purposes. We also have a follow-up paper in which we actually look into the predictive performance of these criteria. So um, do these criteria choose a model that fits well, but at the same time does a good job in terms of prediction? So do, do, which of these models that we're looking at actually balances explanation and prediction? And the results are remarkably consistent with what we found in Journal of the Association for Information Systems. Also, the BIC and the GM, they both perform very well in balancing model fit and prediction. So um, if you're interested in these articles, um, well, we, uh, we are currently um, getting the proof. So we're going to share them if we are allowed to, obviously, on ResearchGate. Otherwise, I'm happy to share my author copy with you. Just drop me an email or drop me a message on ResearchGate. I'm happy to do that. Um, we also prepared a, an Excel template on um, plssem.net, um, which you can find under Downloads. And you can use this template to calculate these criteria. So this is what it actually looks like. Um, the only thing that you need to um, specify is the R square of the target construct. Um, of the saturated model. And you actually don't need that for all of these criteria. The number of immediate predictors for the target construct and the sample size. And um, this Excel sheet will, um, will compute these model selection criteria for you. Uh, so I think I'm pretty excited about this. And um, I hope you are too. Um, so um, in light of the time, I actually want to show you some of the uh, things in, in Smart PLS, but uh, I think I hope I gave you a reasonable a good overview of what's happening and how to interpret these things. Uh, if you have problems, um, just drop me an email. We are actually now working on a little tutorial article on PLS Predict, um, and we're happy to share preliminary versions of the, the article with you if you like. Um, just drop me a message and we'll send that to you. And uh, well, keep updated on research game. So, um, well, thank you everyone. And uh, I think uh, hopefully we have still some time for questions, right? Faisan. Uh, Marco, well done. This was very, very interesting. Um, uh, now, yes, uh, we have time, depending on if you have time. Uh, uh, we have quite a few questions uh, on uh, Facebook and on uh, Zoom. So I'll, I'll start with Zoom. And again, people who are on Facebook, if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments on Facebook. Uh, main video page. Uh, so Marco, what you can do is if you see on your screen uh, down where there's a share screen button, there would be another button uh, with Q and A. Ah, yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you click on Q and A, you will see a list of questions which people have posted there. Uh, I mean, you can answer them uh, one by one, depending on whichever you want to answer. So. Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, Vikas Arawal. Um, okay, how can we use it for prediction? Um, and you're correctly pointing out that many people use. Uh, should I repeat the question? Can everyone see it actually, Faisan, or is it only me? Um, I, I, I think everybody can see the question. Okay. So the, the question is how can we use it for prediction? So the first one. And um, well, I, I hopefully I answered that in the course of the presentation. I see the, the question came in um, a little earlier. And um, yeah, we use it for predicting case values of the original data, which were taken out in the holdout sample. And um, they can actually come from the same sample, but they can also come from, um, from different samples. Like we use um, the survey to, uh, well, to get data from different population or from different contexts, yeah, let's say a different culture. And then we use, these estimates to pre predict the stability of our estimates from another context. Um, and well, in PLS predict actually use a sub sample, yeah, a sub part of your sample. So that's how you use it. And it doesn't matter if that actually comes from survey or from uh, some secondary data source. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. So um, hopefully I answered that, yeah. Um, uh, Marco, I, I just want to stop you here. Sorry. Uh, I, I just realized that uh, Facebook people cannot see the questions since the oh, questions okay. are on Zoom. So if oh. you are not using your slides, uh, I will share my screen. That way everybody can see the questions on the screen. Okay. 
um, you know, so if you look at the screen now, everybody can see the question. So while you are answering the questions, uh, people on Facebook can also look at the questions oh. on screen. Is that okay? <clears throat> okay. Well, why, why is it non-parametric? Uh, well, because we don't make the, the assumption of, of normally distributed errors. They are actually in the course of the estimation. There are some assumptions uh, regarding the, the normality. So it's actually not truly non-parametric. That's right, but uh, violations of this are not severe at all. Yeah, it's it's a bit like in, in OLS. I mean, yeah, it is parametric, but it's not one of the Gauss-Markov assumptions, right? I mean, if you um, if you have uh, non-normally distributed errors, well, worst thing that happens is you can't inter interpret the t-values anymore. In PLS, we don't go that route in deriving t-values right away. We use bootstrapping. Um, to get them. Yeah? So this is what makes non-parametric in, in this sense. Yeah? Um, we got linearity and all these things. Obviously, we have to check for that. Yeah? And actually, we also have to check um, for uh, omitted variable bias endogeneity. And uh, happy to, to share that with you. Just uh, three days ago, our paper on endogeneity um, assessment and treatment in PLS has been accepted in Journal of International Marketing. Uh, we haven't shared that with everyone, but we will. And uh, so this is a way of, well, again, testing one of these issues in, in OLS that we well, currently deal with in OLS. You know? um, is it an alternative to CBSEM? Um, I'm not going to go into detail here because this has really been documented in the literature. I hope you forgive me. We have so many questions. Um, um, how to run PLS Predict with Smart PLS in our software? Um, I think we have some time. I mean, I have time. I can show you, okay? Um, so <laughs> maybe I can share my screen with you. Is that okay? Yes, uh, Marco, I'll stop sharing my screen. You can go ahead and share your screen so that people can see. Yeah, okay. So I just show that to you. In case. Okay, so here it is in, uh, in Smart PLS. And this is our model, the one that I... I showed you before, right? And it's one of the sample models also that comes with the software. So um, I just go to calculate and uh, PLS predict. And there's not much that I need to do here. Um, I just need to specify the number of folds. So the number of runs and like the bins and how many bins the data is going to be um, specified uh, or partitioned, let's put it like that, and the number of repetitions. And I'm just using the default values, which we would suggest on until somebody else comes up with another reasonable number. Um, but 10 folds is typical in prediction studies. The repetitions, well, it's more like how much time you have on your hands. Yeah? So, and what you see here are the uh, prediction errors for the individual items. So these are the items actually from the endogenous constructs. And let's focus on the customer loyalty ones because this is the final target construct in the model. So loyalty, CUSL 1, 2, and 3, these are actually the target constructs, uh, the target indicators um, of our model. And what you see here are the RMSE values, the MAE values, and the MAPE values of the, um, of the PLS models. And you also get the Q square, which, um, which is kind of the naive training like the, the mean value, yeah? But let's focus on the uh, RMSE and MAE values. As I told you, the MAPE is not really uh, very handy because of the restriction in terms of the uh, zero values. And what we do now, we compare the PLS estimates here with the LM estimates. LM is the naive benchmark, and the naive benchmark is the regression of, say, customer loyalty one on the exogenous constructs indicators. So... By specifying such a linear model, we are um, neglecting the entire model structure. It's only the input layer, the exogenous constructs, and the, um, the output layer, kind of the, the customer loyalty. And we would expect that these values here are actually larger than the errors produced in PLS, because in PLS you have an entire fancy model that you specified, and you want this model to be better than the naive benchmark. And as you can see here, the RMSE for customer loyalty one is 1.301 versus in customer loyalty one in the naive benchmark is 1.309. So you have a slight better prediction in the PLS model. For customer loyalty two, we've got 
in the linear model here, we've got 1.539, so better prediction here. And finally, for customer loyalty three, 1.532 versus 1.573. So again, we've got a smaller RMSE induced error in the PLS model compared to the linear model, which would support that we actually have predictive power in this model. <clears throat> so this is how we, we deal with the PLS predict. Yeah? Um, so if we look into another question, what do you think? You and A, there we are. Yes, okay. Marco. So um, I, I can read the question quickly um, so that everybody can hear it. We have some problem with questions uh, on Facebook, like nobody can see them. So um, the next question was, can we report D underscore ULS and all those uh, model fit indices for simple PLS models? I'm confused that these measures are suitable only for PLS consistent. Um. Yeah, the the question is where they actually this notion comes from that they are only suitable for uh, consistent PLS. Um, it's probably because they these measures have been advocated in articles which also advocate the use of consistent PLS. Yeah, uh, so there's actually no no uh, no good reason why it is limited to consistent PLS, but it can also use in regular PLS. Yeah, sure. With all the limitations I talked about, yeah. So in terms of thresholds terms of uh, the actual computation uh, and all that. But I understand now from a, from a publication perspective, this is what reviewers request you and me to do. And you might want to go down that route. Yeah? But I'm not fully convinced that it's always correct. That's all, all I can say. Yeah? Um, Thank you. Is there, yeah. Is there any relation? Marco, the next question is, is there any relationship between these criteria and R square of the construct? Um, slightly, I never thought about it. Um, I never thought about it, but it could be in the RMS theta I would expect that there is, yeah, because if you have high residual correlations, that's also going to boil down to the R square thing. Uh, with the SRMR, I'm not sure about that. Um, like rather not, I would say, but, um, uh, I'm not 100% certain, yeah. With the RMS Tita, yes, I think there is, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, I'm planning to study the relationships between utilization and implementation of healthcare service. This will involve two groups of population, uh, which are the public and the healthcare professionals. Is it possible to create the path model? No. Uh, yes, I mean, you would create one pass model and estimate it in, in two different groups. Um, so in the first group and the second group. And then you would, uh, to do that, um, you would have to establish measurement invariance first. There's this MECOM procedure, which you might have seen. And uh, MECOM uh, um, is, is a procedure for establishing this measurement invariance. And it's also implemented in, in Smart PLS. And uh, yeah, once you have established at least partial measurement invariance, you can actually compare the path coefficients among these groups using multi-group analysis. Um, there's actually a, a, a nice uh, paper in or chapter in the edited volume uh, by Latana Nunan, uh, published last year, um, on multi-group comparison. And uh, we also have a chapter in there on unobserved heterogeneity, mm -hmm. in which you also talk a bit about mm -hmm. this thing especially about the MECOM approach. But in case you have questions, drop me an email and I'll um, just send you the papers, okay? Sure. Uh, Marco, the questions are increasing. So we'll see whenever you are done, like whenever you think we should be done, just let me know. And then for those people whose questions are not answered, we can- uh, We should just do another seminar, I think. What do you think, yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, of course, if, if, if you agree, we can do another uh, seminar just for questions and answers related to PLS. Uh, you know, we can yes, do sir. that um, because I don't know right now what's the time in Germany. So <laughs> uh, it's 5.20, so I'm still okay. Um, don't worry. Okay. I'm just not at home at the friend's place and they're probably going to drop in a second. So but let's just go, yeah, until... Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you for being so kind, Marco. Um, so I'll, I'll go with the next question, which is uh, I have a question about justifying choice of measurement approach for formative versus reflective. Uh, uh, since there's a lot of debate about this concept yeah. among methodologists, there are a lot of yeah, references. To... Yeah, it's a kind of, yeah, I know. I know. 
um, it's um, it, there are two layers here. Yeah, the first one is actually the me the measurements layer, where we talk about measurement conceptualization. Yeah, so we ask ourselves, okay, how do we actually specify a measurement model? This is independent from the actual estimation layer, and we try to um, lay this out in a in a 2016 JDR article where we distinguish these different layers. Um, the, I don't think there's much debate that you can actually specify something formatively. And I'm just using this term, know that there's lots of baggage coming with it, but there are, that there are actually concepts where you combine several indicators to form them, like the marketing mix, for example, is a nice example that your pencil always brings up. You have the price policy and you get the distribution policy and the product policy and so on. So this is actually formed. And we would call that a formative measurement model conceptualization. So this is different from the actual statistical treatment of them, yeah? As you know, mm -hmm. ELS always computes composite models and kind of like treats them as formative, even though it's actually not happening at the, in, in the back end, yeah? <coughs> but um, right. yeah, this is it, yeah. So thank you, Marco. Now the next question is a very interesting one. Uh, we have got a lot of experience with this. So the, the, the person is asking, at least one mainstream journal started desk rejecting any study based on PLS why PLS community does not do anything about it? Oh, oh no, we do. <laughs> we actually published <laughs> a, um, a rejoined an organization research methods in which, well, I believe we refuted all these comments. Um, and uh, the, the critical paper by Rönke and Eberman, I think they, they did a good job. They just um, they pointed to some real issues and some areas where we really need to dig into. But it's actually um, always a good thing if you criticize something also to offer solutions. Yeah? And that's what we did in the organization research method article and we are still doing it, for example, in this JBR article 2016 and we are working on it, for example, energeneity. That was also one of the issues raised in uh, organization research methods and we said, well, that's true, we need to tackle it. So we did. Yeah? So um, we're working on it um, personally, and this is fully independent from me working in PLS. I think it's not a very wise approach to desk reject journal uh, articles on the grounds of some method. It's just, uh, it's just strange to me here yeah? because there is a place for practically every method in the world here. Yeah? So there are certainly inferior methods and superior methods in several situations. But if you want, you can let every method fail, including regression, including an ANOVA, including covariance based SEM, simply because there's like one or there are two or three papers I think, uh, that very, uh, in a very strong rhetoric criticize PLS, um, desk rejecting all papers. I just don't think that's a very smart thing to do. Yeah? Um, we should rather work on improving it because the method has merit. Yeah, it offers you means to predict and explain. It offers you to uh, estimate very complex models, and so um, yeah, we're just not responding directly um, to to these authors um, anymore. We did this once, uh, twice, yeah, and I think that's it. Yeah, uh, we refuted the comments, and we just don't want to reiterate these things. That's why. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, I would also, do, so these questions we were taking were from Zoom. There are a few more, but I would also shift to Facebook. There are a few questions there. And I also want to thank Professor Roldan uh, for answering some of the questions related to PLS consistent on Facebook Live. So just wanted to uh, appreciate that. Um, there's a question uh, which says that re redundancy analysis show value less than cutoff value, which is 0.62. Uh, this is below the defined thresholds, which shows that my scalars fall short of convergent validity. Please advise what can be done in from statistical or procedural point of view to settle or justify the issue. Uh, this is the formative model or the, the redundancy analysis in Oh, which one? Sorry. Yeah, so that's all we have. Um, so, Mumtaz, if you are uh, listening to it, if you can add some more details to your questions, please. So, so we'll wait for some detail on this question. Um, formative, formative model. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Uh, just to clarify, yeah. 
Um, well, what can you do? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Basically, uh, it is um, it's telling us that the um, that the formative measurement is not fully capturing the essence of the reflective alternative measurement. So there are two reasons why this is happening. First one, either the reflective measurement is corrupt um, or the formative measurement is not uh, strong enough, meaning you don't have enough predictors. Um, so usually the, the problem with redundancy analysis is that you always have the, this, like this endogenous construct, which is either measured with a single item or with reflective multi-items. And so there's also some, always some ambiguity to the quality of the, the target concept, the endogenous one. But assuming that you did a good job in specifying this, um, the result would tell us that you actually need more indicators for, or better indicators for the formative construct. It's obviously bad news because you likely already gathered the data, right? So, um, bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so thank you, Marco. Uh, are you okay if I go ahead, keep going yeah. with the questions? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> as long as the right. goes out, that's fine. <laughs> so, okay. We have right now seven open questions, so I'll just go on with them. Um, we have a question says, can we look at the total effect across all latent factors and use that to compute a relative impact of all exogenous variables on one endogenous variable? Sure. Yeah, that's is, that's how you do it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's how right. you find. Mm -hmm. Now the same person asked another question, which is that uh, how much impact do number of measured variables or items in a latent variable impact the effect of that variable on another variable? Which simply means that if um, I have a b a and b causing c, a has ten items, b has five items. Does this create an unnecessary bias towards A in my model? Uh, yeah, it, it tends to do so, yes. Um, that's the, uh, what we actually took a look at in, the, um, in our studies on single item scaling. And this is mm -hmm. now the extreme case yeah, where you look into a single item where, where you reduce it to the max. And um, where the more indicators you have, the, the lower the error is going to be because the, the error average is out um, if you increase the number of uh, indicators. Um, in CBSEM, this was never really an issue because most people um, want to minimize the number of indicators that they use uh, to get the model identified. So you use like three or four indicators per construct to get it at least identified. Yeah? So that's why most CBSEM models have three or four indicators. Now with PLS, we are suddenly looking at a method which can accommodate several hundred indicators per construct in theory. Mm -hmm. And this, um, in fact, um, triggers a certain bias. Now, I wouldn't really call it to be a bias, but it's uh, a slight tendency, let's put it like this, yeah? that mm -hmm. some effects are probably inflated a bit, yeah? but it's not going to be severe. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. So now uh, another question is, I've heard that SEM is overused in hospitality field of study. How does smart PLS differs uh, which I believe it's covariance-based and PLS-based SEM. And what are the future projections of this being saturated uh, in the near future? Well, Faisan, I'll probably give that back to you. You're the hospitality <laughs> man here. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to say that we did a, like me, Marco, uh, Christian, we all did a paper recently on the usage of PLS and hospitality. I think the answer to this question is in that paper, uh, comparing the use of PLS, uh, covariance-based SEM and PLS SEM. So I would uh, recommend reading that paper. It does explain some of this stuff. All right, um, and then uh, there's another question, which is, are there any plans to update Smart PLS 3? I think Ringel, uh, Christian Ringel, would be the best person to ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's so, in charge of it, actually. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not officially part of the Smart PLS team, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, most people think I am, but we are obviously working on the algorithms together. But uh, yeah, he keeps me updated on the, on the progress. And yeah, sure. Uh, there are lots of things uh, happening in the background, like these um, model comparison indices, uh, the endogeneity is something that they're going to tackle um, soon, different types of algorithms. Yeah, they're going to be updates, and pretty soon too, yeah. Okay, so Marco, we are left with last three questions, and I'm going to go quickly through them. How can we use control variables in SEM? Should we control only dependent variable or all the variables? 
Uh, well, yeah, only the dependent variables because the control variables um, account for part of the variation in the dependent variable. And uh, what you would do in PLS, let's say you have an endogenous variable like customer loyalty or so, yeah, like in our model, and you want to control for age, you would have a new construct in with a single item, age, and here a single item is not a problem because age is directly observable. And you would link this construct to the customer loyalty construct, to the endogenous one. Um, this, there, I'm aware that there's quite a bit of discussion about the choice and the specification of control variables. There's a nice article in organizational research methods on this. And I would just advise you to take a look at that. But um, yeah, you can do it and okay. to a certain degree you should do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Now, another question is, can you explain a bit about consistent PLS bootstrapping? I don't know if you have to go to PLS, uh, smart PLS to do this. If you have to do that, I'll ask the last question before this. So there's uh, another question which is, uh, recently some papers are trying to use a kind of nonlinear method, including PLS SEM. How is your opinion on using the nonlinear methods? Yeah, um, probably first about consistent PLS. Um, I'm not going to go into the software now because it takes a, a while to run the, the bootstrapping. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the bootstrap, like first of all, consistent PLS um, is for those that don't know what it really is. Yeah, it is uh, alternative PLS algorithm which um, corrects for the PLS bias and the PLS bias, I'm using this term cautiously here, because uh, PLS provides biased estimates in, in case you have purely factor model data, so from a factor model population. If you have composite model data, PLS is unbiased. Yeah? So uh, whether your data come from a common factor model or composite model, difficult to tell. Yeah? And actually that's one of the pending issues now for, for researchers to find that out. The thing is, PLSC, to uh, correct these estimates, it uses this uh, reliability coefficient row A. And the, the problem with the bootstrapping in PLSC is if well, you randomly draw on observations and then you're computing the row A. But if you have a very extreme sample, the row A is also going to be very extreme. And this extremeness has a very negative effect on the correction factor. So the correction is, is going to be super severe. Yeah? Um, how to deal with this, Adanko, which was the first software to implement um, PLSC, to the best of my understanding what they did, it, they just took out the extreme bootstraps. So I might be wrong about that, and if I'm sorry, Jörg, yeah, maybe you changed this by now, but they basically deleted the extreme samples, which is kind of twiddling around with the data. So I don't know how they actually resolved it, and to be very frank, I don't know how... Um, yeah, smart PLS is doing this at the moment, yeah. So uh, this is certainly an issue in PLSC-based bootstrapping. And the final question, the nonlinear. Um, yeah, um, nonlinearities are part of everyday life, that's true. And um, there are many situations where relationships are rather nonlinear than linear. Yeah, that's also one of the key selling points of programs such as Warp PLS, yeah, which try to find out these nonlinearities or Newsreel, for example, another software which does a good job in identifying them. Um, the thing is, um, if you have nonlinear relationship, then uh, it gets very difficult to interpret these relationships and these estimates and standard assessments like the R-square uh, suddenly don't work anymore. You need like pseudo, pseudo R-square and so on. Um, in most cases, unless you have like extreme forms like a U-curve or so, in most cases, the linear relationship is a reasonable approximation of a nonlinear relationship in most terms. This is not always true, yeah? but it's true in most cases because if you look at standard regression models across like all of science, and I'm not talking about social science now, I'm all of science, yeah? you typically don't see... Um, researchers pre-specify nonlinear relationships. Yeah. If they estimate something nonlinear way, they do it like Newsreel, for example, where they have neural networks which try to fit like the lines specifically to the data set. This is truly explanation then, because you're overfitting the data that you have, and this is not what prediction is all about. When you take prediction seriously, I think it's better to stick with linear relationships as long as they are actually reasonable to uh, defend. 
All right. Thank you very much, Marco. I really appreciate the time you have taken. Actually, we have passed the one hour pretty early. So, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, and, and I, I'm happy that there is a lot of interest in PLS and people have questions. And then we have amazing people like yourself who are willing to share their knowledge and their expertise with everybody. So we'll probably work on another webinar to see if there are any questions and if you're willing. Uh, I'll probably invite you again. Um, for now, I really appreciate and I thank you. For the people who are online or who are listening throughout, I thank you all to come uh, join this webinar. And uh, one announcement is that this webinar is recorded. So once we are done, we'll be uploading the video on the website of Anahe. So you can always go back and watch uh, the whole video and um, we can also send an email to all the people who registered with a link to the video. So if you have missed any of the answers to the questions, you can uh, go back and listen to the answers uh, to all the questions that were asked. Um, with that, I think it's time to um, be done with this webinar. Marco, do you have anything else to say? Uh, just thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your fantastic questions. Uh, very much enjoyed it. Uh, it would be nice to come back and uh, yeah, drop some email supplies sure. on me in case you have specific requests for topics. Uh, that, that'd of be course. nice. Why of not? course, again, yes. And, if you have any uh, questions, any uh, concerns or comments, you can email me or Marco um, and we'll be uh, happy to answer your questions. Thank you once again. Thank you one, one, probably one thing. We are uh -huh. going to be offering a... Um, a seminar on um, basics and recent advances in Hamburg um, mm -hmm. in June. So in case you want to join us, come by. Um, or we are always happy to come by your place, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And, and the details about that uh, the seminar are on Smart PLS's website and on Facebook page. So if you need any details, you can get on the website or Facebook page. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much.